The word prostitute is insulting to sex workers. Notes from the Edge of the Narrative Matrix. Responding to a war caused by NATO expansion by expanding NATO. Fighting Russian authoritarianism by increasing censorship. Fighting Russian propaganda by increasing propaganda. Pursuing peace by rejecting diplomacy. Defending Europe from Russia by bombing European pipelines. Twitter has dropped its entirely appropriate designation of NPR as state-affiliated media, instead creating an entirely new designation, government-funded, which it has also given to accounts of outlets like the BBC and Voice of America. You still see establishment guard dogs decrying this new label for Western propaganda outlets on nonsensical pedantic grounds, but really the problem is that they're not receiving the same state-affiliated media label as outlets like RT and Press TV, despite being equally propagandistic. The label is designed to provide the false impression that Western propaganda outlets are not propaganda outlets. It's actually very revealing how huffy and indignant empire apologists are about getting the government-funded label, because it shows that they see it as Twitter's responsibility to facilitate Western propaganda. Imperial spinmeisters have a vested interest in maintaining the illusion that propaganda is something that only happens to other people, and any move that might disrupt that illusion even slightly is met with hostility. It's one of the most shameful jobs in the entire world to spend your time doing critical reporting on the enemies of your government while ignoring your own government's far more egregious crimes. People talk about sex work as shameful, and in America they'll even shame you for working a low-paying job like McDonald's, when on all our screens every day we see people selling their own government's ugly foreign policy in a line of work that his entire universe is more shameful. That's why I dislike the use of the word prostitute to refer to these people. Not because it's insulting to the press, but because it's insulting to sex workers. Over and over again, we see U.S. officials talking very differently about a hot war with China over Taiwan than they ever talked about hot war with Russia over Ukraine. This is absolute screaming insanity, and it should enrage everyone. The U.S. has no place flirting with the possibility of an Atomic Age World War over a long-standing inter-Chinese conflict that's none of the West's business. It should enrage us all that they're talking about throwing our sons and daughters into the gears of that horrific war. Here's a quote from the Wall Street Journal. In an unannounced visit to Saudi Arabia earlier this week, CIA Director William Burns expressed frustration with the Saudis, according to people familiar with the matter. He told Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman that the U.S. felt blindsided by Riyadh's reproachment with Iran and Syria, countries that remain heavily sanctioned by the West under the auspices of Washington's global rivals. China brokers a peace deal in the Middle East, and the CIA director flies into Babel about how this makes the U.S. empire's feelings feel. China must be stopped before it imposes totalitarian diplomacy on Ukraine and authoritarian peace in the Middle East. We've got to stop China from achieving peace over there so we don't have to stop it from achieving peace over here. It's a completely false narrative that the U.S. is polarized politically. On the most consequential matters, both factions are always in enthusiastic agreement. The divisions are limited to superficial culture war issues whose outcomes will never affect anyone with real power. Here's a tweet by Michael Tracy about the similarity between Kevin McCarthy and Nancy Pelosi on their posture towards Taiwan. Same old story. During elections, Republicans and Democrats scream that the differences between them are so seismic, civilization itself hangs in the balance. Then on the most consequential actions they can take, like hurtling into World War III, they behave exactly the same. If anything, the U.S. could stand to be far more politically polarized because it would mean actual political opposition happening in the world's most powerful country instead of nonstop kayfabe combat where the empire marches on uninterrupted regardless of who's in office. What would it mean if humans are the lone intelligence in the universe? If there are no aliens, no gods, no conscious AI waiting to emerge in the future? Well... 
It would mean we've got a lot more responsibility, for one. Nobody's coming to the rescue. It's on us to fix this mess. And I think that's probably a big part of what drives the belief that we are not alone. Not because the evidence is particularly strong, but because of how intimidating the prospect is. That's what I find when I look within myself, anyhow. When I ask myself, what if we're alone in this? The very first response that comes in, up within me is, ha, ah, shit. Because think about what that would mean. Think about it and feel about it. Not only would it mean we're permanently on our own when it comes to fixing all our massive problems, but we've also got a massive responsibility not to fuck this all up. If we're the only intelligent life in the universe then we've actually got a serious responsibility to try and preserve that life. I mean, if we wipe ourselves out with nuclear war or environmental collapse, or with some other wonderful technology-based emergence we haven't invented yet, then that's bad enough by itself. But if on top of that, we also wiped out the only intelligent life in the universe, it's almost infinitely worse, no? It means we didn't just inflict that horror upon ourselves, we inflicted it upon the entire future of the entire universe. And I just think that's probably what drives a lot of the belief that there's something else out there. The fact that we're all kind of intimidated by the responsibility which would come with our being alone. 